Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's meeting of the Manningham City Council. We'll start, as always, with the opening prayer and statement of acknowledgement. Almighty God, we pray for your blessings upon this council, help and prosper its work for the advancement and benefit of its people, so that peace and happiness, unity and justice may be established among us all. Amen. 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 Manningham Council acknowledges the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of the land we now know as Manningham. We pay our respects to Wurundjeri elders past and present and value the ongoing contribution to the cultural heritage of Manningham. Council would also like to acknowledge the contribution made to Manningham over the years by people of diverse backgrounds and cultures. I welcome all members of the public to this council meeting this evening who have joined us online to observe proceedings. In response to the evolving coronavirus situation, recent changes were made to the Local Government Act which permit council meetings to be held virtually for a limited time. The health and safety of our community and employees is our priority during these uncertain times. So we are holding virtual council meetings to further reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19. You will notice therefore a few changes to how we are conducting our meetings. Public are not able to attend the meeting in person, but you are, as you can see able to watch the meeting live via our council Facebook page. You are also able to watch the recording of the meetings at any time at, a, at any day at a, in a situation that suits you because we do post the meetings online on our website. We are still taking questions from the public and encourage you to submit your questions in accordance with our normal practices at the start of the meeting. As you can't be present in the chamber to read your question, we will read it out for you and a response will be provided where we have the information to hand. If, you, if we are unable to provide a meaningful response, we will take your question on notice and provide a response in writing. We will deal with a maximum of two questions per person and two questions on any one issue. If you have more than two questions, please submit these additional questions in writing to council through the normal channels. Finally, I would like to advise that if we experience any technical issues during the meeting, we will make every attempt to resolve them within 30 minutes. If we are unable to resolve the issue, the meeting will be adjourned until another time and date. A notice will be placed on the council's website advising the meeting has been adjourned and when it is expected to reconvene. <clears throat> Regarding our council meeting procedures, all council meetings are governed by a meeting procedure local law. I will introduce each item of business as listed on the agenda, calling it by number and by reading the title. I will then call for a mover and second of a motion on the item before any opening any debate. Only councillors are able to join the debate on an item. Councillors may ad adopt the, the, the officer's recommendation in the report or propose amendments and supplementary motions. Item two, apologies and requests for leave of absence. I would now like to confirm the council attendance. Councillor Mike Zafiropoulos. Thank you. Councillor Anna Chen. Could uh, the officers please unmute the councillors for this purpose? Councillor Andrew Conlon. Present. Thank you. Councillor Sophie Galbally. Here. Councillor Jeff Goff. Present. Councillor Dot Haynes. Here. Councillor Michelle Kleinert. Present. Councillor Paula Piccinini. Present. There are no apologies. Thank you, councillors. Item three, prior notification of conflict of interest. No prior notifications of conflict of interest have been received, councillors. Would anyone like to give notice of a conflict of interest at this time? No. There's no indication from any council that they wish to, so we will proceed on that basis. Item four, confirmation of minutes. Do I have a mover for this matter? Councillor Conlon. I'd like to move the recommendation be adopted. Could you actually read the motion as it pertains specifically to 
which meetings we're adopting. Ah, uh, actually, can I withdraw my nomination? I've lost okay. a piece of paper here. That's, so. right. That's okay, Councillor. We I can handle that, Councillor Kleiner. Move that the minutes of the ordinary meeting of council held on the 23rd of June 2020 be confirmed. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Conlon. I'll put the motion. Please indicate your support by raising your hand. Thank you. I see all hands raised. That motion is carried. Item five, presentations. There are no presentations. Item six, petitions. There are no petitions. Item seven, public question time. We have received a number of questions for tonight's council meeting. At this time, anyone submitting a question to council is not required to be present and we'll, I will therefore read the questions out loud. The first question we have this evening is from Ms. Cynthia Pilly. Given the council is advocating a Templestowe Road upgrade, why is it necessary as the main purpose of the North East Link is so that traffic numbers will be reduced on roads in Manningham and other municipalities? And a central purpose of public transport also proposed on Templestowe Road would be to prevent expanded road capacity for cars, resulting in degradation of the road environment. Thank you for your question. The reality is that the upgrade of Templestowe Road has been a key advocacy action for Manningham Council for over 15 years, as outlined in the Council's Link Road Strategy 2014. Road safety is a key consideration in the upgrade of, our, of the road, given its existing arterial function within the road network. The North East Link traffic modelling is also based on the assumption that Templestowe Road will be duplicated by the time the North East Link begins operating. Therefore, Council has been advocating to the government and to the North East Link project in support of the duplication of this road. Council's objectives for the duplication include the provision of a new shared path and a new bus service along the road to connect to the Pines and to the Holderbird, to connect the Pines to the Holderbird Activity Centre train station by Templestowe Village. And I am pleased to see that is one of the outcomes of um, the le rec our recent legal action in respect of the North East Link is that the state government has committed to funding uh, the design works in respect of the Templestone Road duplication. And as a council, we're very pleased with that outcome. Question two, will council be informing residents that it has withdrawn from the combined legal challenge concerning the North East Link and that the promised consultation is anticipated to lead to fundamental changes to prevent damaging noise and air pollution from CO2 vehicle emissions. Prevent destruction of public parkland instead, open up discussion for public transport alternatives. Doncaster Rail at Melbourne Metro 2, freight on rail instead of trucks, as well as create thousands of jobs to give local roads back to local people, slashing travel times. Um, in response to this particular question, the council has released public statements advising of our withdrawal from the Supreme Court proceedings and the outcome achieved for our community, including ongoing opportunities for council and the community to be further consulted in the final road design. In relation to the noise and air pollution impacts, the minister has imposed a number of environmental performance requirements that the North East Link project must meet with, EPA, with the EPA as the relevant authority for ensuring that these EPRs are met. In relation to Public Transport Council has and will continue to strongly advocate for, to the state government for improved public transport services for the Manningham community, with the main focus at this time being local bus services <coughs> and the bus rapid transit and the suburban rail loop. As previously noted, a bus service is being is also being pursued along Templestowe Road. And I'm pleased to say that um, the government has recognised the advocacy that we have been making over 
a, more than a decade in respect of Doncaster Rail and Bus Services, and that the Pro North East Link project will in fact deliver a separate busway to the, from uh, Punt Road all the way to Doncaster and involve a new bus interchange and at uh, Bulleen Road and a new park and ride facility at, uh, at Bulleen Road, which will be of great benefit to the commute to, to the public transport commuters of Manningham and comes about as a direct result of the, of the very effective advocacy on by council and by the council officers in respect of public transport. Thank you for your question, Ms. Pilly. Pilly, we do appreciate your interest and enthusiasm on these issues. The next uh, question is from Mr. Barry Watson. We have received a couple of questions. Um, Mr. Watson's not able to read his own preamble to his question, so I will go through that. So obviously when I'm speaking for the next couple of minutes, I am not making comments of my own, but I'm speaking on behalf of Mr. Watson. I'm disgusted that the City of Manningham, which I and thousands of other residents and ratepayers should be able to trust to look after our interests, has capitulated in abandoning the legal action against North East Link and the Victorian Government. Residents' health and wellbeing has traded for questionable offerings in relation to open space. City of Manningham are gloating about an upgrade to Lower Templestowe Road when the North East Link is supposed to reduce local traffic. Manningham are also gloating about relocating soccer fields to what should become open space parkland as compensation for what Nell has taken away. Mr. Mc Mayor McLeish and the councillors and senior officers should reflect upon Barry's previous representations on two major health issues council is failing its duty of care to confront, air quality and road traffic noise. So while I note the word pollution does not appear in our media statements, we residents are waiting in the slaughter yard pen. You need to consider how to confront the Andrews government and North East Link to provide the following pieces of work, which are vital protection of our health and wellbeing. An EPA conducted state environmental protection policy, AQM study for air quality, which is a legislative requirement not done in the EES. A properly supervised road traffic nighttime noise impact study for years 2028 and 2048 by NELP, not done in the EES. Jacinta Allen's letter in response to questions in Parliament number 1846 says the night truck noise has been modelled. NELP are saying no night noise has been modelled. Incredibly, we have a North East Link in environmental effects statements. We have a North East Link Independent Advisory Committee panel report, and we've received the Planning Minister. Mr. Wynne's Nell report, which in order have failed to provide these studies. Heavy truck numbers are projected to increase from 6,000 a day to 21,000 a day. 2009 noise limits, night noise limits will be exceeded as determined in the EEF. The Wynne's prescribed 55 dBA free field limit increase is massively above the 2009 World Health Organization limits of 40 dB for nighttime hours. It predicts a large freight increase at night in his report. Uh, he goes on to quote our media release, which I won't repeat, but you can find our media release on our website. I have met with Manningham Mayor McLeish and Council CEO. They have demonstrated they do not understand the scientific complexities of air quality and road traffic noises, and I question whether councillors do either. So Mr. Watson's first question is, with Manningham Council Will Manningham Council join forces, forces with our own community and other bodies as may be most effective, including Burundara, Whitehorse and Banyul Councils, to compel North East Link Project and the EPA to do what has not been done so far as part of the EES and legislative processes? Uh, I will refer that particular question to the responsible officer who this evening is Niall Sheedy, Acting Director, City Planning and Community to respond. Yeah, Niall is just joining us at this moment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Watson, for your question. Uh, Council will continue to advocate strongly to NELP and other state uh, authorities to ensure that all appropriate measures are taken 
including noise pollution and air quality to mitigate the impacts of the project on the community. It is again also noted that the environment uh, performance requirements as defined by the planning minister would provide controls to mitigate these impacts to the community with the EPA, the relevant authority ensuring that these are met. Council cannot oblige another state authority to undertake additional studies as per your request. I note, however, that in relation to nighttime noise, the Minister for Planning's assessment on the Northeast uh, Link project recommended a nighttime noise limit be applied and that the current traffic noise reduction policy is outdated and needs review. I also note that the new EPA Act will come into effect in July 2021 and NELP will need to continue to work with the EPA to align any project approval documentation or subsequent management plans with any new regulations as required. Thank you, Mr. Sheedy. Uh, we have a second question from Mr. Watson. Will Manningham Council invite residents into detailed consultations with the Northeast Link project contractors on works and design, or will Manningham engage expert environmental scientists and acoustic experts both during future consultations with the Northeast Link project contractors or both? I'll again uh, refer that question to Mr. Niall Sheedy, Acting Director of City Planning and Community to respond. Th through the chair, thank you uh, for your second question, Mr. Watson. Uh, the state, in accordance with the environment protection requirements, is required to undertake consultation with all relevant stakeholders on various aspects of the project. Council has negotiated additional consultation with NELP and their contractor once uh, the contractor is appointed as part of our settlement through the Supreme Court proceedings uh, mediation. It is advised that Council engages uh, expert consultants to assist in providing feedback to NELP on the various parts of the projects as required. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Sheedy. <clears throat> we have also received um, some questions from Mrs. Meg Downey. <clears throat> Question one. It is pleasing to learn that Manningham City Council has withdrawn its legal proceedings against the North East Link. The Manningham community will benefit from the Andrews government's investment in local sports facilities, including a new three field soccer facility on Templestowe Road. My understanding is that when the North East Link project is completed, Manningham residents will benefit five, from five new sporting grounds worth millions of dollars funded by the Andrews government and will enjoy the access to the North East Link will offer to the North. How much ratepayer money was spent on legal action and was anything more achieved because of the process? Thank you for your question, Mrs Downey. I appreciate you advising the community of some of the benefits that accrue to our community courtesy of the um, strong and determined action which our council has taken in representing uh, our community in the action that we took recently, which we recently withdrew from, in order to achieve a degree of certainty for our community in respect of the outcome <coughs> from the North East Link project. When the minister promulgated his decision earlier this year, our, our council lacked certainty in terms of the outcomes for our community. We didn't have an understanding of what the impacts would be on our local sporting clubs. We didn't have decisions on what would happen to the, uh, the land in the, in the precincts around the North East Link, whether that's through Bulleen, where the North East Link itself comes through, or whether it's along the Eastern Freeway, where there will be significant widening occurring. We have, through the actions that we've undertaken in conjunction with other councils, now achieved that certainty. And I note that um, the, uh, many of the other councils have already withdrawn their action. Uh, we have delivered uh, a safer upgrade for pedestrians trying to access across the Yarra River along Manningham Road, where the government has committed to provide a grant to the city of Manningham of $5.8 million to build a new pedestrian and cycling bridge from Bulleen Park across the river to help link to Heidelberg Station. That there will be detailed planning work and business case as noted earlier for so $3 million at least, worth at least $3 million for the duplication and upgrade of Templestowe Road. There will be upgrade to ovals within Bulleen Park as is being noted, up to three, three, two ovals will be upgraded and one new oval will be built and ancillary sporting facilities will also be constructed in the park 
which will be a significant benefit to the football and cricket clubs in that precinct. We've been able to protect the parkland within the Bulleen Park from expansion of other facilities, thereby ensuring that the aero modelers and the archery clubs that operate from Bulleen Park will continue to be able to operate there. We've protected the passive open space within Bulleen Park so that the walking, jogging, cycling and other uses that occur along the riverfront there will continue to be able to occur without interruption. If the Eastern Freeway is right and the North East Link have also agreed to notify residents who are impacted through parts of that widening directly so that they are able to understand what's happening as part of the community engagement process. Indeed, we have, through our advocacy, also um, achieved some commitment from the government to look at the planning opportunities to return other land along Templestowe Road to further expand the open space available in Manningham, north of Templestowe Road towards the Yarra River. So I'm very pleased at the strong advocacy that our government, our council has undertaken and the investment that we've made in the legal action have delivered certainty of outcomes for our community in a way that simply wasn't there at the last milestone of decision made by the government and the North East Link in respect of this project. And I'm therefore very comfortable that I believe, Mr. CEO, it's $150,000. Um, has been invested in this court matter and we have achieved very good value as the United Council, the nine council as you see here before you this evening, supported us taking that action after taking considerable advice, professional legal advice in how to approach this matter and we have delivered outcomes for our community. There are issues we haven't been able to resolve, we know that, but we can't resolve everything but we have been able to, through this investment, make significant progress for the benefit of our community. I'll now turn to the second question that Ms. Downey, Mrs. Downey has asked. I refer to the draft governance rules, which are now out for public comment. I note that in the preamble, there is mention that changes have been made in relation to the election of the mayor and deputy mayor. It is important for the public to witness the full process take place on the council floor? Is it intended that the practice of having a closed meeting of councillors to select one candidate for each position on the night prior to the AGM will cease? I'll refer that uh, question to Andrew McMaster, the group manager for government and risk to respond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, thank you to Mrs. Downey for her question. Uh, the draft governance rules do not significantly alter the process for election of the mayor and deputy mayor. Uh, the most significant change is that the chief executive officer is required to chair the election process, uh, and that's in accordance with some new legislative requirements which are contained in the new Local Government Act 2020. Um, as is currently required, all councillors uh, must vote on the floor of the public council meeting for their preferred candidate. Um, and as is the case currently, there is no prohibition on, in the draft governance rules, which would prevent sitting councillors um, from meeting to discuss candidacy for the roles of mayor and deputy mayor prior to that public meeting at which that formal vote is undertaken. Thank you, Mr. McMaster. We have also received a question from Ms. Chris Rentoulis. Is the council aware of the increased parking congestion that is occurring on Roderick and the Bryden streets by outside residents parking vehicles all day to attend work at the local police station, catch public transport and visit shops at Devon Plaza? And if so, can the council begin the process of installing residential parking permit signage to address the issue? Uh, I will refer this matter to Rochelle Quattrucci, who is the Director of City Services to respond to this question. We've just joined the meeting for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chris Renaultis, for your question. Council officers have been monitoring parking along Roderick and Dryden streets, and we are aware that there have been some changes to parking along these streets. And that is due to a combination of things. One, COVID-19 restrictions have led to an increase in residents parking within the area and along these streets. Also, some of the vehicles are contributed to the local police station and people frequently visiting Devon Plaza. There are 
already restrictions within the street, two streets you have referred to, to limit all day parking. Along Dryden Street on the eastern side, there is four hour restrictions to parking. And along the northern side of Roderick Street, there is also four hour restrictions to parking. At this point in time, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, we are not undertaking any planning enforcement. The, the area is not a residential parking permit zone currently. However, in making an accurate assessment, we were looking at a parking survey at a later stage when traffic conditions normalise. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cotrucci. We have also this evening received two questions from Ms. Stella Yee. Question number one, are council buildings equipped with solar panels? If so, how many kilowatts of electricity are those pallet panels currently producing? I will also refer this particular question to the Director of City Services, Ms. Cotrucci, to respond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Stella Yee, for your question. Manningham Council is committed to solar power, clean and renewable sources of energy that can reduce carbon pollution. Manningham Council has recently installed 550 kilowatts of solar to council buildings, which includes the council depot operation buildings and the Mullum Mullum Stadium. In support of council environmental goals, to deliver energy and emission savings in council buildings and also to improve council building standards. Better Building Design Guide, together with a five-year program of building solar installation and energy efficiency improvements have been developed. And these will include the installation of 700 kilowatts of solar energy and energy efficiency improvements over the next five years. Solar will be installed at two more buildings this financial year. That includes 18 kilowatts at the Pine Centre in Doncaster East and 16 kilowatts at the Ted Ajani Centre in Lower Templestowe. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that quite neatly deals with the second question also. Uh, the second question asked by Ms. Yi, does council have plans to expand this and what is the targeted capacity in terms of kilowatt and what is the time frame? So that's a comprehensive answer for both questions. Thank you. Uh, we have an, uh, another question from a resident, Ms. Ms. Bree Gamer. Gamer. I am currently owner of a building. I'll try that again. I'm currently owner building a property in Donvale due to and due to Victoria's state of emergency and the global pandemic that is coronavirus. My project has been impacted since March this year. My planning permit run, runs out in November this year, and I've requested for an extension of time to complete this. I currently have foundations and a frame for my house, but there had but have had to pause due to a delay in materials and labour on top of significant financial strain. The extension to the planning permit, that is, cost $652 and I've been denied a request under hardship relief. My partner and I are both on JobKeeper and have a commitment to complete our family home. However, such a fee is very prohibitive and does not seem to reflect Council's objective to provide relief to your suffering community. My question is, given that Council, indeed all governments in Australia have recognised this unprecedented pandemic has affected everyone both personally and financially, why would Manningham City Council not consider waiving or reducing such fees in relation to the extension of time? <clears throat> Many built planning and building permits in the municipality have been affected and robbed of at least six months of time to complete projects. I think Council should consider at the very least a six month extension on planning permits or with no or significantly reduced fees. These are residents who are struggling already with potential unemployment and halfway through building a house. And they, these residents are also exempted from the federal government home builder scheme. It's not in the council's best interest to have residents fork out additional fees due to circumstances beyond their control or have financially struggling residents forced to abandon half built homes. I would appreciate your view on this and thank you for considering the question. 
I'll refer that question to Niall Sheedy, the Acting Director, City Planning and Community, to respond to this question. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor, and thank you for your question, Ms Gamer. In response to uh, the COVID-19 situation and to provide financial assistance to uh, the Manningham community, Council committed to a financial relief package with a cost of approximately $3.8 million over the current and the next financial years. So the Council is certainly acutely aware of the financial impact COVID-19 is having on the community of Manningham. This relief, uh, of course, is in addition to the assistance provided by uh, the other tiers of government. Officers uh, will make contact with you over the coming days to seek more information on your individual circumstance and will provide you with uh, further advice on the possibility of extending your planning permit after gathering the specifics of your situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shetty. Uh, that is the end of questions from of questions this evening, councillors. We're now moving on to item six, admission of urgent business. There are no items of urgent business. Item seven, try that again. Item nine, planning permit applications. Item 9.1, planning application PLN 19-0226 at 969 to 973 Doncaster Road, Doncaster East for the construction of a four-storey apartment building comprising 35 dwellings, basement car parking, and the creation and alteration to a road in a road zone category one. Do I have a mover for this particular matter? Councillor Haynes. Yes. I move the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Galbally. Thank you. Councillor Haynes. Uh, just uh, in brief, councillors, um, you're aware, you've seen on the papers that this is a recommendation to approve um, the permit application. Uh, it has been through extensive um, conversations and we're very aware that um, being a Doncaster Road site, it is in DD081 and um, this, this um, application does fit within the permit rules, but it also has a few extra additions that even... Um, will benefit the community um, as far as it, its height isn't isn't to the total height. And also um, it has a good design outcome. It, it does fit within the new planning design guidelines, including some extra size balconies. So amenity for the people um, is, is a lot more, um, it, it's gonna be much nicer for the people that do decide to live in it. Um, it does fit within all of the um, coverage issues and um, it is within the residential go sign, and um, I ask for all the councillors to uh, to approve this. I wouldn't like to see it go to um, VCAT because we would probably lose some of these conditions that officers and things have um, discussed and worked through on behalf of our community. So I ask that all councillors um, uh, approve this site, this application. Thank you, councillor. Councillor Galbally. <clears throat> Nothing to add on that. Thank you, Councillor. Do any councillors wish to speak against this matter? Any other councillors wish to speak for it? No? Uh, Mr Mayor, may, yes, I speak, uh, may I speak about the, the application, please? Certainly. Um, yes, there are some issues we need to address as well, just some fundamental issues. And we all know that there are some developments, modest developments near Devon Plaza. Yes, this is a DD08 area, but only modest developments near Devon Plaza because it's away, far, further away from Doncaster Hill. And this is the first of the size and the perspective uh, views on page 24 and 28 speak for itself. And level three covers nearly 4% more than the 75 requirements. And the three dwellings on the top level will be visible from the street. Once built, it will create visible dominance. And the site was assessed as substantially meet key criteria as a strategic redevelopment site. But it is not specifically identified in the municip municipal strategic State, uh, strategic statement. Therefore, it is good practice always if we can encourage reasonable transition 
or provision of buffer zone to soften the density and visual impacts. Another concern is that most of the dwellings are, will be two bedroom and only one three bedroom is proposed. Well, it provides enough housing choice for family with young children. And apartment visitors often choose to park on streets rather than use the available on-site car parking for reasons of risk or convenience. Although on-street parking is not a planning issue, but the increase of parking demand will impact the surrounding residential areas and affect local amenity. The local residents have already felt the impacts of congestion and air pollution. Large apartment development further contributes to harder and less welcoming streetscapes and buildings. Even the particular development uh, met most of the requirements under the current planning scheme. As a council, we need to encourage developments that are contributing to a welcoming and engaging streetscapes. Its bulk, its form, and height are sympathetic and have a positive impact to our local area. The city we built today is the city our children or grandchildren have to live with. We need a more considered developments. Therefore, I'm able to support this application because of its build form, unable to enhance the streetscapes and the impact to the amenity of the neighborhood. That's all I need to say. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Do I have any other speakers for this particular matter? In that case, I will no, provide no, an opportunity up. for Councillor Haynes to sum up. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And I do um, see Councillor Chen's points. And uh, um, as for Doncaster Road, there are many buildings that look the same along that close by um, and uh, just at Jackson Court and near Devon Plaza and they are working their way down Doncaster Road. Um, it is definitely not uh, what some of us want to see. I don't think it's the best look, but this one compared to some of the others that have been approved further down towards Jackson Court, uh, definitely on the other side of the road, which are on the same side as this one, are... Uh, um, are definitely uh, th this this development itself is a uh, better quality uh, as far as amenity for the people that will be um, living in it. So um, though it may not be um, exactly what some of us are wanting, it does fit not only within the planning scheme but also provides seven spare and extra car parks for visitors that isn't within the planning scheme because the planning scheme that the state has put through last year was that there are no visitor parking. Um, essential. So uh, we are really glad that the officers have worked well for this outcome. As far as parking goes around that area, not just on Custer Road, but the side streets, including Roderick Street, as, um, as I'm aware, not only with the past, past questioner, but also with Councillor Chen, I would also like to ask and request counts, um, Council to deal with the fact that we've got the growing developments and within our area, and we do need to make this a priority to deal with the Roderick Street issues, not just um, the response that I have heard prior from the officer. So I would like okay. that to be considered with the growing developments and trading parking as well. Um, so I would like That's to fine, thank you, Councillor. So, but I still ask that we um, pass this motion. Thank you. Councillors, I'll now put the motion. Those four, please raise your hand to confirm. Thank you. Those against? Thank you, Councillor. The motion is carried. That takes us to item 10, City Planning and Community. 10.1, proposed park on Hepburn Road, final concept plan. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Haynes. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for this matter? I second, second Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Chen. Councillor Haynes. Uh, Councillors, um, this is quite exciting. We're getting a park closer on the Doncaster Hill. Um, this has been as part of the strategy for over 15 years. So it's good that it is finally coming to fruition. And uh, it seems that we seem to be moving ahead 
in leaps and bounds all of a sudden, but it has been a long project getting there. But we have already gone out to community with the um, consultations, with the draft concept plan. We now have before us the final concept plan and uh, this recommendation is to proceed to design details. It's pretty exciting. It's in an over 3,000 square metre um, site and it has um, a number of different um, <coughs> age abilities to be able to use it and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing that move forward and I'm very happy to report if you look at the report councillors and community that um, they are now preparing communication seeking naming options and the timeline to proceed with this is quite short in the scheme of government to actually have it uh, detailed and finalised by the end of 2021 and built. So um, I'm really looking forward to the progression of this and what we're doing here for our community and also with other parks and things with our 10 year plan. So I ask councillors that you uh, pass this um, final concept plan to go forward. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Chen. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. The proposed park on Happy Road will provide a beautiful, well-maintained and safe piece of parkland within the Doncaster Hill area. I encourage the public to participate in the consultation process and I look forward to its delivery. Thank you. Councillor, do I have any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? That being the case, I will put the motion. Those four. Thank you. That is carried unanimously. Item 10.2, public toilet plan draft for public ex exhibition. Do I have a mover for this particular matter? Councillor Chen. Mr. Mayor, I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? I'm happy to second that. Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Councillor Chen. Yes, Mr. Mayor. This agenda item impacts everyone in our municipality. Public toilets are a basic necessity for a socially inclusive community. They offer pregnant women and disabled people a place to relieve themselves when home is just too far away. A blessing for parents and where the homeless can take care of their personal hygiene. For those who have mental health issues can use the place as a refuge to collect their source and relax. The plan is a 10 year plan to ensure our public toilets are safe, accessible, well maintained and sustainable. The plan is also significant because this is Manningham's first public toilet plan. The plan includes a number of actions, including open 10 existing toilets to provide new public toilets facilities, construct new public toilets in 10 locations over a 10 years period, upgrade seven older style toilets to improve safety and be gender inclusive, replace three existing toilets to more modern standards, construct accessibility orders and upgrade access paths to public toilets, provide changing places at major destinations, provide public toilets along linear trails at regular intervals, and finally, investigate artworks programs on blank walls of toilets to improve perceptions. The total cost is $4.5 $3.33 million over 10 years. Each additional toilet will incur $52,000 maintenance costs. I recently received an email about accessibility of public toilet. It said, and I quote, this is extremely frustrating, especially as a woman and to our older female players. For reasons I'm sure you understand. Yes, I do understand the frustration. If the 10 year po uh, public toilet plan is endorsed tonight, it will go out to the public, com to public comments in early August for four weeks. I sincerely hope that the lady who wrote the email and as many people as possible 
to participate in the consultations. A final public toilet plan will be presented to council for endorsement in late 2020. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Oh. Councillor Conlon. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Chen. This is uh, not a very glamorous thing, uh, a report probably, so, but it is one of the, as Councillor Chen mentioned, this is one of the most important functions of council to provide this, uh, these facilities. So I congratulate the officers on uh, bringing this to us and for having the vision for this um, ongoing need. I can't see anything happening soon in evolution to stop this need, but um, anyway, but uh, I hope you can support this, uh, this uh, vital service to the public. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Do I have any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Haynes. Mayor, just quickly, I'm just really excited about this report myself. It addresses some of the community safety issues of people that have been going and using those toilets, including myself and, and others um, uh, for the toilets that are existing. I'm really excited with the fact that uh, the safety issues will be dealt with to do with um, helping hopefully with more lighting, more security and a lot of other safety issues that have been occurring and that we are addressing them through this report. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing um, and feeling the, uh, the comfort that's needed um, at these services, myself and also for the rest of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Councillor, is there any other speakers for the motion? Well, I will make also make an observation on this one because I'm very pleased to see this report coming forward. I can only agree with Councillor Conlon's observation that this is one of the nuts and bolts issues that we ex-councillors work on. And um, as a parent and grandparent, my frustration at using local parks that don't provide facilities that enable a father to take their young child to a toilet, if they have a daughter with them, it's extremely frustrating to visit a public park and not be able to use facilities. Uh, plenty of times in my life, not having access to change facilities for changing babies, having to change baby on the floor of a toilet. It's a terrible situation to find yourself in and to see us finally having a strategy that's actually gonna to close out some of these gaps in our public parks and build accessible toilets, which provide for all levels of ability and any gender combination that is making use of the facilities, any parent, any guardian is a great thing. So I'm very much looking forward to this, this pro long overdue program actually being delivered for our community. So councillors, I will now put the motion, those four. <clears throat> Thank you, I see all hands raised. So that is a unanimous decision. Thank you, councillors. Item 10.3, Disability Advisory Committee Terms of Reference. Do I have a mover for this particular matter? Councillor Galbally. I've got a, um, I've got a mover, but with an amendment, if it's okay. I'll, um, it was pretty late in the day, so I'll probably have to read it out to you um, as soon as I find it. Page nine. Yeah, no, the amendment. <laughs> So um, the recommendation reads that A, we approve the draft disability advisory committee terms of reference attachment one, subject to the following amendments on, in section five to include, council will ensure that members are supported to choose the best method of communication that enables them to carry out their role in full and are able to participate in meetings remotely if unable to physically attend. Section nine to include where interviews are required, nominees are given the opportunity to choose the most appropriate form of communication and may participate in interviews remotely should they be unable to physically attend. And um, uh, note B, uh, we note an expression of interest process will commence July 2020. C, note that officers will seek endorsement of the DAC membership in late 2020. And note that officers 
will report back on of alternate mod models to the current Access and Absolute. Equity Advisory Committee prior to June 2021. Thank you. So that's, that's it in full with the amendment. And you. do you want to hear about the reasons for my amendment? No, I'd really like to just, now that we know what the motion is, I'd like to actually have the motion seconded and then you can actually speak to it. So is there a second of this particular matter? Councillor Piccinini. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Galbally. Uh, yeah, look, uh, it's it really, uh, in reading the um, officer's report, which I've got to thank them for, they were very, very efficient and covered all grounds. But um, I would just like to add that for people to, if we want to encourage people with disabilities to apply for this um, EOI, if we can remove the barrier that may arise for um, um, particular disabilities where they um, they need that extra support in communication methods and um, and sometimes they may need to um, attend remotely. So um, it's really just as an information so people are comfortable to apply. So that, that's the reason behind the amendment. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Councillor Piccinini. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to add that I, I spoke in favour of motion for a discrete disability advisory committee at the June meeting. And we do have before us the terms of proposed terms of reference today. Um, and I'd like to highlight that one of the terms of reference is that um, we will endeavour to ensure that at least 80% of the membership of this committee are uh, made up of people with lived experience because people with lived experience are the best people in my view to ask about the barriers to inclusive inclusiveness and i think today what we've seen is a case in point because we've had councillor sophie galbally look over those terms of reference as a woman with a lived experience and pick out barriers to participation and propose changes to lower those barriers. So it's actually a case in point for why we should have this committee and we should have on this committee people with lived experiences. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. Are there any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? In that case, I will put the motion, those four. Thank you, councillors. I see all hands raised, so that motion is carried unanimously. Item 10.4, Smart City Opportunities. Do I have a mover for this particular matter? Councillor Zafropoulos. I'd like to move that uh, the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, councillor. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Kleiner. Councillor Zafropoulos. Yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, council a year and a half ago decided to establish a livability innovation and technology committee, mainly uh, to explore the development of a smart city. The concept of smart cities uh, had been around for a decade or more. Uh, and more recently in Australia. Uh, that committee was established on the 23rd of April uh, 19 and met several times and has provided very useful advice to council, including the, the idea that embracing the smart city objective will enable council to introduce innovative practices across the organisation taking advantage of technological advances and successful implementation at other councils, both in Australia and overseas. Experience we have uh, shows that smart cities improve the services they provide, generate financial efficiencies, and generally improve uh, the livability of their citizens. Uh, council in conjunction with uh, the consultative committee, with the advisory committee, appointed Dallas Delta 
to support us explore these issues. Uh, Delos Delta uh, conducted a number of uh, consultations with council, staff, and the community, and came up with uh, a couple of papers. One is the Smart Cities Opportunities paper, and the other one is the Case Studies document. Uh, the re consultant's report was reviewed by council in May this year, and uh, we were very pleased to receive it. Uh, what this recommendation and report uh, does, it identifies the principles, strategies, and steps required uh, f during the next 12 months for the transition uh, through the various stages of successful implementation of the report's recommendations. That is to create uh, an implementation of a smart city plan and to develop the case studies into mature briefs. I strongly recommend that we endorse this valuable project, which has the unanimous support of the committee. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> Do I have a... Uh... I'll try that again. Councillor Kleinert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, it's a it's a very good report. I sit on the um, committee, uh, also with uh, Councillor Conlon as well. Um, it's basically this report addresses the what next for the smart cities opportunity. It's um, the 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 consultants um, Dallas Deloitte have done an excellent job. And just to give you an idea, should we endorse that tonight? Which uh, I encourage that we do that unanimously. It will set uh, our, our basically the next steps. Um, there's smart city priorities um, that we have identified for, uh, as an example. So digital democracy, smart environmental management, smart asset management, smart data management. Um, really interesting considering the times that we're in and that we are so reliant on um, tech and, um, and having it immediate, having it accurate, um, very much uh, a lot of this um, aligns with that as an example the digital democracy modernization of de democratic processes and institutions especially by digital tech um, to enhance community participation deliberation empowerment and real-time feedback so as an example um, you know this sort of project would be um, once it becomes very normal for us as a smart city um, would be uh, an amazing tool to be having in this current climate where people can feel so um um, disconnected um, from the process of, of local government. So it's, it's some really great priorities that have come together and um, it's, it's a really good report and the officers um, together with the committee have done a great job to, to bring some really great priorities for our city moving forward. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? In that case, I will put the motion. That I those four. Thank you, councillors. I see all hands raised. That's unanimous. The motion is carried. Councillors, that brings us to item 11, city services, 11.1, outdoor sports infrastructure policy. Do I have a mover for this particular matter? Councillor Zavropoulos. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Goff. Councillor Zafiropoulos. Uh, look, we're all aware that participation in organised sport has been increasing in recent years, not on, on here at Manningham, but just about everywhere. Uh, we have something like 70% of Manningham's residents uh, 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 playing uh, uh, acting in physical activity uh, uh, and uh, and this is high, uh, likely to increase. Uh, obviously this increase necessitates the building of uh, more facilities uh, and uh, increasing their capacity, increasing uh, and making them multi-purpose. Uh, 
and uh, uh, in, in addition to building new facilities, the maintenance of uh, the multi-purpose usage of these facilities, the facilities we've already got, is important because land and funding uh, are scarce uh, in a right cap capping uh, environment. Uh, and also the provision on maintenance is a lesser cost than the construction of new facilities. Although new facilities might still be required. Uh, council also needs to adapt to the Australian standards in, in relation to legislative and risk compliance, particularly as uh, this is important for us meeting our uh, insurance uh, responsibilities. This particular report uh, recommends uh, a new sports infrastructure policy, which includes a number of um, amendments in the existing uh, uh, guidelines that we've got. Uh, these amendments include uh, a facility hierarchy uh, based on the catchment of participants. Uh, now, instead of having just facilities, we now have uh, regional, municipal, um, where else, uh, district, local, and school facilities. Identifying those uh, for us to manage. Uh, facility, a new set of facility standards, which uh, reflect the hierarchy, as I mentioned before. Facility, facility fit out items uh, and uh, the policy identifies who's responsible uh, for funding them. Uh, the financial contributions by council and other parties. Uh, it also, the policy recognizes the very important in-kind contribution that uh, a lot of uh, users uh, of these facilities make, which is a, a welcome uh, addition to the policy. Uh, the other thing uh, is that the policy does is it changes the financial responsibility for sports uh, fields floodlighting uh, with council being responsible 100% for upgrades up to training standard. It used to be 100%. And uh, also uh, uh, changes the, uh, the, the responsibility of council for match standard to 50%. There are good reasons for all this. And uh, what uh, is attractive to me is the fact that uh, all the new uh, Flood light, uh, all the new uh, lighting will be LED. 30 which, seconds, uh, Sorry? 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Uh, LED, which will contribute to Council's commitment to uh, climate change. Uh, I, th I feel that this is a well thought uh, uh, change of policy, and I hope that it will have the unanimous support of Council. Thank you, Council. Councillor Goff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, one of the biggest things is, is uh, for local government seems to be sport. We are the biggest funder of sports and it's an essential element of our community, uh, especially sport for children and for amateurs. Um, you know, that's uh, one of the big roles is to have facilities in the community for the community and council take that up and Manningham is probably in many ways at the forefront uh, with its facilities throughout. When I first got to council, Mr. Mayor, I was told it's very difficult to get equity in sport. And uh, we've tried for so many years to work out ways in which we as council can explain how and why we spend money in certain areas. And this policy is essentially important. Now, we're tonight not approving the policy. Well, I think we're putting it to go out to public exhibition. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Yeah. So this is going to be going out to all the sporting clubs uh, that are covered by this, and it covers the majority of, of outdoor sports and the facilities and attached facilities such as uh, uh, 
stadiums and, and change rooms and uh, lighting, and as we've said before. And indeed, you know, when it gets down to looking at this, it's uh, important to be able to plainly put on paper what our policies are, what we do and don't fund, and so that all can see what we're putting in to the clubs and how we're doing it. And it's also good for all the clubs to understand the position that they're in, because we do indeed spend a lot of money. And if you look, uh, councillors uh, in, in sports fields, um, you know, uh, we, are, we are providing a lot in providing a lot of the things at 100%. And there are some things that we go half and half on, like in the ten with tennis and and uh, uh, hockey and those those um, what are they called uh, synthetic uh, surfaces and things like that and specialised surfaces. But uh, it also goes into the reasons that some club rooms are bigger than others and all the rest. Blah blah blah. It goes down. We've got a hierarchy. It's all spelt out there, and that's very important so that the whole community understands. Uh, our commitment, and it's a major commitment that we have in Manningham to sports, and it's a major expenditure that we have. It's one of the biggest ones that we have in Manningham. And so seconds. I look forward to this going out and uh, for feedback from all of those uh, bodies that are, are uh, covered under this uh, policy. Thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers, any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? In that case, I'll put the motion. Those four, please indicate by raising your hand. I see all hands are raised. That motion is therefore carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 11.2, sporting field allocations policy. Do I have a mover for this particular matter? Councillor Piccinini. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Zafiropoulos. Councillor Piccinini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as opposed to the policy that we've proposed, policy that we've just moved, this policy is actually a brand new policy. And it's called the proposed policy because it will also go out to public consultation to our sporting clubs and community, probably at the same time as the policy we've just discussed. And it's a proposed sporting facilities allocation policy. So what this policy does is it sets out how we as a council allocate our outdoor sporting facilities and pavilions to the various clubs and organisations in our community. So it's an excellent um, piece of work that has been completed by our sports and recreation team because um, it makes it very clear to the, the proposal is to make it very clear to the community how we, what, what, what is the eligibility criteria for clubs and organisations to seek to be allocated these facilities? Um, what are the important criteria that will be taken into account when there's a dispute? between two clubs over a particular sporting ground or facility. And um, it also sets out nicely the types of allocations, such as, is it a seasonal allocation, an annual, casual, or a lease agreement? And what it also does, which I quite like, is in relation to eligibility, of course, our organisations will have to have insurance. They'll, they need to be incorporated, incorporated associations and be members of the relevant sporting codes. But what this policy also adds, which is, in my view, innovative, and I'm sure Councillor Goff will support in relation to his comment about equity in sport, and that is that the groups, any group that is seeking to be allocated um, a sporting facility must provide a strategic plan which outlines their commitment to inclusiveness. So what we're asking our clubs to do is to show us how they're going to provide, how they're going to be inclusive and, and, and make sure that everyone in our community will have access to their club and to the facility. Because inclusiveness is a really important value that this community holds. So I really like that innovative approach to this policy. 
Um, and it deals as well with personal trainers, which is something that as a council, uh, we, we need to now address because personal trainers are often using our facilities now uh, to conduct the business. And um, it's proposed that when they do do this, they actually use our sporting grounds and not our public open space um, because it, well, partly because it's safer for them to use um, properly manicured grounds rather than a public open space. So I put this proposed, I, I endorse this um, proposed new policy to be, to go out to public consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Zafiropoulos. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think Councillor Pizzanini has uh, comprehensively uh, covered uh, what is involved in this sister policy of the one I referred to before. Uh, for me, what is very important in relation to that policy is uh, Council's uh, goal to increase the transparency. People will now be aware of what criteria are being used for the allocation process, particularly when uh, uh, the, a particular facility is used by a number of groups. It'll be clear uh, whose responsibility it is and uh, how the what, what how the process works in order for uh, space and time to be allocated to each group. So I also endorse that. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have any speakers against the motion? Do I have any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Haynes. Also, I would like to say is I want to thank the CEO and the officers and the executive for putting these two reports out to public at the same time. Uh, this is this is good. This is something we don't normally see. We do it in pieces and things, but because these are so important to the community and so many different um, parts of our community, I just want to thank the officers and I want to thank the three councillors for what they've said about um, these two going out to public. I look forward to um, hearing from all the different sports people and also what we take back to, um, to the officers for final say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other speakers for the motion? There being none, I will put the motion. Those four, please raise your hand. I see all hands are raised. That motion is carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 12, shared services, 12.1, adoption of the 10-year financial plan 2020-21 to 2029-30. Do I have a mover for this particular matter? Councillor Chen. Yes, I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Goff. Councillor Chen. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Financial plan can identify Council's current and projected financial capacity to continue delivering high quality services, facilities and infrastructure. And in the meantime, avoid exceeding our budget or going into debt. So council can remain financially sustainable for future generations. The attached 10 year financial plan covers the period two, uh, from 2020-21 to the year 2029 and 30 and provides councils the framework to make some financial decisions. The annual budget 2020-21 representing the first year of the financial plan. The budget also incorporates the four-year strategic resource plan representing year one to two to uh, year one to four of the financial plan. The rate revenue forecasts are based on the state government rate cap forecast estimated to be 2% to 2.5% per annum. The, the plan represents council is in a solid and steadily improving financial position to continue provide services and maintain over $2 billion worth of community access. The financial plan is updated annually to reflect current economic and financial forecasts. It is very important, especially at these unprecedented times. 
I recommend council to adopt the 10 year financial plan as table. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Councillor Goff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the officers for coming with this document. Um, it's very interesting. Look, this is a bit of a crystal ball. It's, it's, it's useful. Uh, will it carry out that way in 10 years? Who knows? But it's a way in which we can sort of try and map out how we're going to go into the future to remain sustainable into the future, to be able to deliver the services to our community and to reach those expectations and so that we know how we've got the money and where it's going to come to do so. And, and that is a very important thing to be able to do. Now, in order to do this, we've got to make a number of assumptions. We've got to make assumptions on interest rates, rate rises, uh, rate income, grants that we're going to get. This is all crystal ball stuff. And so and we've also got to make uh, crystal ball statements on employee costs and, 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 and costs of services and, and utility costs and a whole lot of other things, contracts that we've got, uh, a whole lot of other things that we need to sort of put into the mix and, uh, and strategically look at our financial uh, situation going forward. Uh, indeed, when you look at this, um, you can see that in the first year or so, it sort, sort of drops off in, in when we look at it through uh, Vago, have a checklist and the local government performance has a checklist. And in the first couple of years uh, does affect us slightly uh, in the performance into that long term but it only affects us because of all of the action we're making on COVID. We're spending unprecedented money uh, on, on, uh, on our budget in this coming year on COVID issues. And uh, there are a number of extrapolations from that that have effect for a couple of years after that. And this 10 year plan shows how we get out of that and, and get viable. Even withstanding those minor points, and there are two minor points uh, they are on, I did have it written somewhere. Uh, there are two major points uh, on the table there, but what, what it does show us is that overall, we are still in a, a sound financial position and maintaining liquidity and being a sound financial position into the future over those years. And it's from that basis that we now move on, I suppose, after this to our four-year financial plan, which is it has in more in detail in it what we're expending on what and uh, also uh, our annual budget. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, this is an important document in part of the Put process of preparing our budget, and I recommend it to councillors. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a speaker against the motion? Are there any other speakers for the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. Please raise your hand to indicate support. Those four. Thank you. I see all hands raised. That motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 12.2, the 2020-21 annual budget incorporating the four-year strategic resource plan 2020-2024 and adoption and declaration of rates and charges. Do I have a move for this particular matter? Councillor so Goff. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Do I have a seconder? Thank you. Councillor Conlon. Councillor Goff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, this uh, budget process has been going on for quite some time before, before Christmas uh, last year and uh, worked on and uh, went out to the public in, on the 26th of May as our budget in principle. And we've had submissions from people uh, in that time. There were quite a number of submitters on, on various topics and uh, one was on rate treatment and uh, differential rates. And there were quite a number of, that were talking about that. Uh, but there were a number of other people that uh, made budget submissions. And there were a number of people, I think there were three people that spoke at our meeting that we had uh, via Zoom with regard to the budget. Um, the people that spoke, those issues have been considered and uh, been chatted about quite extensively by council. And there have been reports back it, it, they were, uh, it was, we were lucky in a number of cases where the issues that people raised were able to be uh, explained and moved uh, in the current funding that we've got. Uh, for example, uh, types of uh, uh, 
treatment of uh, recyclable products in our furniture and things like that. And that's, that is done within budget that was already allocated and things like that. So we've been able to, to look at that. And those people have uh, had their, uh, had, had uh, replies, or well, they will have after this budget replies uh, to their submissions. But I, I welcome uh, those submissions and suggestions uh, to us because it does help us for our future planning as well. Now, it's a, it's a very uh, important budget, this one, because it's come at a time where Victoria and everybody is suffering from the COVID uh, situation and a downturn in a whole lot of things. And as such, uh, I, I would normally be going into what we're doing in uh, Capital Works programs, and if I get time, I might. But uh, it, we have made a number of allocations in this budget that in one way has hurt our bottom line a little bit, but uh, we've got uh, special arrangements with hardship. We're, we're not increasing the waste charge, uh, which the state government are increasing. <laughs> they've, they've suspended it for, for a short period of time, but uh, for the second half of this financial year, there's a huge increase in the landfill levy and, and whatever is going, but we're not increasing our, race, our waste charges uh, to people there. We've increased the low income rebate uh, to $100. Um, and then we've looked at the most vulnerable people and often uh, they are the older people in our, our community and uh, also the people that have had businesses that are trading in our community. And they're the people that are, are, are finding a great deal of hardship and they can't open their premises at the moment. But, you know, there are things that we are doing in our budget for this financial year that uh, like discounts of 50% on trading permits, uh, on food premises registrations. Uh, we're introducing a local government development program and uh, we're offering rent and relief uh, to uh, a number of community organisations and sporting organisations that uh, we are a landlord to over this period of time. And it, it, it comes to quite a substantial amount of money of over $3 million. Uh, and that's in addition to money that we've spent in 1920, which is uh, 750,000. So we, we have, that has taken a big splash on our budget, but we're still in our project uh, coming out, we're still balanced and coming out uh, on that. And we've still got a massive capital works program, which is what I think uh, is important to councils is to have a large and robust capital works program with 32% of rate money, uh, or 30, yeah, I think 32% of rate money going into into our capital works program, and I, it's 50. I haven't got the figure in front of me, but from memory, it's 51 or 52 million dollars uh, in capital program, um, and and that's going to bring to fruition some of the visions that we've had in Manningham over many years, and uh, th that includes the uh, the Petty's Reserve uh, Sporting Development, which is a soccer sporting development that uh, our community are looking forward to, exactly. and uh, a number of lighting projects and. Uh, and uh, look, we got time. Did you say time? We vote for an extension. Seconds. Twenty seconds. All oh, right. An extension. Uh, look, I, I will leave it to the seconder. So uh, uh, I do endorse this. I thank everybody uh, that has been involved in the preparation of this and all the offices. I know how much work it is, and uh, we've gone to committee and thank. Uh, and really, uh, it's a credit to everybody that we've come out with a great budget going into the future and be financial. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Conlon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Yes, you know, considering the circumstances we find ourselves in, this is a very responsible budget and uh, as well as being able to provide significant relief to various partners with, uh, within our community, um, we, have, um, we ha have been able to deliver the things that we just keep on doing as a council and and meet all our um, all our goals in terms of our long term financial sustainability, as we just heard from the previous report. Um, in terms of capital works, out of so on page ten of the budget, it's a really great uh, summary of of what we spend our money on. So, cap out of one hundred dollars, thirty one dollars ninety eight, so thirty two percent goes to capital works. Another eight and a half percent goes to roads, footpaths, and drainage. Um, and then there's 
another eight dollars forty in parks, gardens, and sports grounds. Planning and environmental management gets another six and a half percent, or eight. Oh, sorry, almost seven percent. Age and disability support services six point seven percent. And health, children and families four dollars forty four. These are and these are just this is just a really quick snapshot of the hundreds of um, services we provide to the community in a financially responsible way and in a way that is effective. And so, I congratulate uh, the officers in uh, particularly in um, formulating this budget and for listening to councillors over the council laws over the um, preparation of this budget, which is, as Councillor Goff said, it's been a long time coming. This was delayed because of the um, legislation of mind it, um, it allowed us to delay where we, we would normally do this because of the COVID crisis. But um, it is a timely budget and I I hope the um, I hope that uh, all my fellow councillors will support it um, as as it is as um, and it has been very well prepared, very clear, and very thorough. So, yeah, I just uh, hope hopefully we can all support it and um, thirty seconds. And I look forward to um, seeing the implementation of this budget. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Uh, do, is there any speaker against the motion? Are there any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Piccinini. Well, let's not forget too that we are a debt-free council. And with this budget, we will continue to be a debt-free council. So I think this budget reflects our community. It's fiscally conservative, it's prudent, and it's very thorough in its analysis and the way it allocates funds. So it's sustainable. So congratulations to the officers for an excellent process and a very good budget. Thank you for continuing to make us debt free. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other speakers for the motion? Councillor Zafropoulos. It might be unnecessary, but I think it's important to congratulate the administration as it has already been done by the mover seconder and councillor Piccinini. Uh, what uh, our residents and ratepayers owe to know is that we're enjoying a stability and uh, a, a positive future despite the difficulties we're going through. Uh, and this is not necessarily spread of uh, the other 78 councils. Uh, many councils are facing uh, financial difficulties and as a result, they reduce their services uh, because they cannot increase their rights. We uh, uh, ought to be very proud that not, not only we don't reduce services, we have been improving services. We're looking at new things like uh, innovate, do things smarter, uh, uh, undertake uh, uh, different initiatives that will improve the way we engage with the community. So uh, this budget is a good budget. Uh, and I congratulate the, the CEO and the administration. Thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers for or against the motion? I will, in that case, put the motion. Those four, please indicate by raising your hand. I see all hands are raised. That is unanimous. Thank you, councillors. The budget is passed. Well done. Item 12.3, Annual Review of the Procurement Policy 2020. Do I have a mover for this matter? I'm happy to move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, Councillor Conlon. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Kleinan. Councillor Conlon. Again, one of these dry, not so glamorous policies, but really quite important in the scheme of things. This, uh, this is something that we've got to do every year. And I know 
as per 2.5 in the in the document that next year there'll be some major changes because of the new local government act hmm. however this year it is great to see um, that we have we've taken this seriously this year and i know some of the new um, in, insertions including the procurement principles which include value for money sustainability social economic and environmental open and fair competition accountability risk management probity and transparency these are really critical in terms of high level understanding of the process of procurement also note that um, that the officers have included the new procurement and contract management framework which is a great uh, way of managing the procurement process to make sure that we do continue to get value for money that uh, we do take into account the suitability of suppliers and um, we meet our goals in terms of sustainability and accountability and also note uh, that the, also the insertion of sustainable procurement considerations which is in that PCMF that I spoke about and these are these are great additions to the already comprehensive procurement policy and I congratulate the officers on taking the initiative to improve our policies and to continue to seek not just to be best practice, but to lead the way in terms of procurement practices and um, and set a new standard. So I'm very impressed with uh, with what we've heard from the officers in our briefings, and this is a reflection of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Climate. Nothing to add. No. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? I will in that case put the motion on those four. Those against, that is carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 13, Chief Executive Officer, 13.1, appointment of Authorised Officer Planning Environment Act 1987, the mover. Councillor Conlon. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to, I'd like to put that the recommendation be adopted with the addition of Corey Aldridge to be appointed as an authorised officer under the Planning and Environment Act. Thank you, Councillor. I have a seconder. Councillor Piccinini. Councillor Conlon. Nothing to add. Thank you, Councillor Piccinini. Nothing to add. Are there any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers to the motion? I'll put the motion in those four. Please raise your hand. I see all hands are raised. That motion is carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 13.2, documents for dealing. Do I have a mover for this particular matter? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Haynes. I move that an alternative motion um, rec be recommended. Would you like me to read out the alternative I'm motion? you need to, councillor, yes. Fine, I'm happy to. Um, I move that the recommendation, the alternative recommendation be adopted with the addition of the following agreements. Consent to build over an easement agreement under section 173 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987. Council and Asta Development Group Propriety Limited and Zoni Development Propriety Limited, 32 Eric Avenue, Temple Stolower. Also consent to build over an easement agreements under section 173 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987. Council and Sammy Georgie Family Propriety Limited, Unit 1, Number 1, Verbena Street, Templestow, Unit 2, Number 1, Verbena Street, Templestow, Unit 3, Number 1, Verbena Street, Templestow, and Unit 4, Number 1, Verbena Street, Templestow. And also, consent to build over an easement agreement under one, Section 173 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987, Council and A.G. Garner and Y. Chen, 55 Devon Drive, Doncaster. That is all, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Hey, yes. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Climate. 
Thank you, Councillor. Do I, Councillor Haynes? Nothing further to add. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor Kleinert? Nothing further to add. Thank you. Any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers? I will put the motion, those four, please raise your hand. I see all hands are raised. That motion is therefore carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 13.3, record of assembly of councillors. Do I have a mover for this matter? Councillor Piccinini. I move that the recommendation be adopted. Thank you, councillor. Do I have a second? Councillor Chen. Councillor Piccinini. Nothing to add. Thank you, councillor. Councillor Chen. Nothing to add. Thank you, councillor. Any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers? There being none, I will put the motion. Please raise your hands, those four. I see all hands raised. That's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Item 14, urgent business. There are no items of urgent business. Item mm -hmm. 15, councillor, question time. Councillors, do you wish to raise any questions? Councillor Kleiner. Uh, uh, Mr Mayor, uh, I didn't want to bring it up necessarily in the budget, um, but it's something that um, I have a question on with regards to the budget is excellent. I'm glad we unanimously endorsed it. Um, there is a question that I have with regards to the state government landfill levy, which is currently on hold. It's, um, it was due to be increased for all local governments uh, July 1st of this year due to COVID. Uh, they've extended it into uh, January 2021. Um, that in, in layman's term, basically, um, currently our landfill is about $65.90 per tonne to landfill. Gate fee currently ranges about $60 to $103.65. Um, but the land uh, come January, that, um, that levy will be uh, incredibly increased by the state government and put onto us in local government, which inevitably has to go come from somewhere, uh, all of us who are ratepayers. So uh, I'm asking Mr. Mayor, is there any way that um, we can write to the government and start uh, put together, whether it's a, a letter, some sort of advocacy to let the government know that um, come January, uh, we can't take on this levy. This is um, potentially millions of dollars that's going to cost us, um, which is set in by state government and I'm asking that you would uh, write to the, the appropriate ministers um, with regards to, to this. Because I do, I do think if um, we're not already starting to lobby and advocate, um, it's going to be quite an impost on us come January 2021. Thank you for the question, Councillor. I'm certain that we can accommodate that request. We'll, be, uh, continue, we'll continue to advocate through MAV to the state government to address this particular matter. My understanding is that we as a council are gonna be impacted to the tune of a million dollars a year yes. um, in, in, through the impost. And I think that's just in the first year through the impost of these right. um, new levies. And that is charged directly to the ratepayers because it, they're basically the state government is taxing us for disposing of council waste from the, from the community's rubbish, really rubbish bins. Uh, as well as waste that goes out of um, all of our public facilities. And our, even outside of that cost, there's going to be a significant increase in cost to the construction industry because all of the waste from the construction, wa any waste from private industry whatsoever is going to be impacted by the significant increase. It's a three-year program of the state government, which will grow to 100. At the moment, we're paying $92.00 in landfill levy and gate fees per rate payer out of our $253 average rate payer waste bill. And that's going to grow from $92 to $155. And that's going to be the levy straight back at our community. So we will be advocating in, through every channel that we can and in concert with our neighbouring councils to try and get the government to uh, mitigate their enthusiastic uh, passing of this tax on our community and its and its impacts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are there any other questions, Councillors? Councillor Chen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have received feedbacks from local traders about uh, that 
uh, Council's current COVID-19 relief measures and business development program are helpful and appreciated. But the return of the second lockdown is having a devastating impact on economy and their businesses. And uh, they need more support to help their business to adapt and innovate. And just wondering whether we can consider such as helping them de to develop web size, e-commerce, digital marketing, or perhaps funding to assist innovation initiatives. That is from the local traders. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'll refer that particular matter to the CEO, Mr. Day. Thank you for the question, Councillor. I might um, hand this over to Mr. Shi to respond, um, but I do know that we're in constant contact with our business community and very aware of the impacts, particularly on small business, which is our our lifeblood from an economic perspective in Manningham, but I'll hand over to Mr. Shi to, to make further comments. Mr. Shi, is just joining the meeting. I am. Thank you, uh, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, Councillor Chen, for your question. Uh, certainly the introduction of stage three lockdowns or the reintroduction of stage three lockdowns and the uncertainty as to when these will be lifted has introduced uh, further uncertainty for our business community. Um, acknowledging this, officers uh, are currently reviewing how uh, further support can be uh, provided to our business community and are considering options on how existing funds can be reallocated in response to the introduction of the uh, stage three lockdown and further restrictions. Um, once uh, these have been considered, uh, councillors will be advised of these options for consideration uh, as soon as they're, as they're finalised. Thank you, Mr. Shady. Are there any other questions, councillors? Councillor Zafiropoulos. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this morning I had uh, the opportunity to address the, business, the Manningham Business Network on how to recover from uh, COVID. Uh, they asked me to express my personal views given my former involvement in uh, an advisory committee for, for the Minister for Small Business. Uh, what I uh, found at that meeting was uh, what Councillor Chen said, uh, th there is uh, uh, an eagerness uh, for uh, our business community to be supported. And I'm just wondering, uh, all this year we, we have been unable to, because of the restrictions, to engage with the community, to attend events, to call uh, meetings of residents to discuss particular concerns. I was just wondering whether it is feasible for us to uh, organize some meetings with key groups, particularly the vulnerable, such as uh, the elderly, uh, the business community, as we talked about, uh, the welfare sector, uh, even youth. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concern about uh, the mental stability of people staying at home. And I think council can do things even though we cannot meet them in person. Uh, we, these Zoom meetings uh, uh, seem to be a, a good tool for us to at least re-engage with the community sector. Thank you for the question, Council. I'll refer that to the CEO, Mr. Andrew Day. Uh, thank you, Councillor Zafiropoulos, for the questions and the comments. It certainly is something that, uh, as you know, we've enhanced our, our capabilities and our um, capacity to reach out to groups through mechanisms such as this. And I can assure council and the community that uh, we both have an internal uh, group of officers that are focusing on the wide range of health and wellbeing uh, impacts that uh, are manifesting themselves off the back of COVID-19 uh, and the economic ones in particular. Um, and so we've got a group of officers focused in on that meeting on a weekly basis. Uh, and indeed, on top of that, we also have a community group, a group of um, key stakeholders, not-for-profits, et cetera, who, we, who meet regularly also to, to discuss the uh, impacts on the Manningham community and look at various options 
uh, and they include everything from, as you rightly point out, counsellor youth and youth mental health and employment um, impacts right through to connecting with our aged uh, groups and our business groups as well. So we are very much uh, working actively on that space. As you know, councils, councillors and council have also supported significant number of grants that are available to to community. There are a number of grants out there that are alive now if you jump on council's website for groups to, to um, avail themselves of some funding opportunities to be able to continue to, to reach out into the community and make sure that we don't miss anyone. So certainly take the point, council will continue to, um, to look for those opportunities to reach out, convene groups um, and have conversations so that we're right across the impacts on our community. And that's obviously not just now, but quite clearly over the next six, 12 just months to and beyond. With your indulgence, uh, Mayor, just a clarification. I was fully aware of uh, what offices are doing and uh, I'd like to congratulate them because they do keep engaged. The problem I see is that councillors are not. Councillors, I cannot go to any well, community. I'm, event. I'm sorry, Councillor. I, I can't ex accept that reflection upon your fellow councillors in that way. I think that's an acceptable reflection. You're welcome to your opinion, but I can't. No, no, I'm, I'm only expressing my opinion. I'm not imposing anything. I just yes. thought as a, as a council, we would benefit. Council, this is a bit of a debate. Your, 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 the expectation is that you don't reflect on other councillors. That's an extra oh. reasonable expectation of this meeting and oh. reflected okay. on the motives of, of your fellow councillors, I'm afraid. I, I thought the restrictions made it impossible for us to meet with that group. Councillors, I could add that obviously you've got the opportunity to work back through offices and have the technology to be able to, to use um, Zoom technology to, to, to have meetings with, uh, with constituents and with community. So I certainly encourage you to do that. And if you need some assistance, you can obviously uh, come back to the organisation and we can help you out with that. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other questions from other councillors? Okay, we have lost Councillor Conlon for a moment there. Uh, well, he will be back with us in a second. There he is. Thank you, Councillor. Good. Just a camera issue. So, Councillors, uh, are there any other questions from other Councillors? In that case, Councillors, we'll move on to the next item, item 16, confidential reports. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would like to move that Council consider item 16.1, collaborative procurement for advanced waste processing solutions in the open meeting of Council, subject to the removal of the second sentence in clause 3.6 of the report, which contains confidential information. Thank you, Councillor. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Kleinman. Uh, this is a procedural motion, so I will put the motion through the meeting. Those four. I see all hands raised. That motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 16.1, collaborative procurement for advanced waste processing solutions. Do I have a mover for this matter? Mr. Councillor Mayor, Holmes. I move that Council A notes the contents of that report, of this report. B, supports participating in the solution development phase of the advanced waste processing as facilitated by the Metro Waste and Resource Recovery Group, known as MWRRG. C, provides delegated authority to the Chief Executive Officer to make necessary decisions and enter into agreements to pro pro progress the solution development phase. D, provides delegated authority to the Chief Executive Officer to enter into agreements for Council to join the STV Special Purpose Vehicle, subject to the, w, the MWRRG satisfying the Chief Executive Officer that the process for the formation of the SPV will be in compliance with Council's obligations and the Local Government Act of 1989 and E, having the right to withdraw from the SPV at any time prior to the final tender phase. 
Thank you, Councillor. I have a seconder for that motion. Councillor Kleiner. Councillor Haynes. Uh, no, I'm just glad that we can bring this to the public and not confidential. I think um, I look forward to seeing how they can progress this further. Nothing further to add. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kleinert. Totally agree with Councillor Haynes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any speakers against the motion? Any other speakers to the motion? Councillor Chen. The clarification about... Uh, about Section D, Local Government Act 1989, is it correct? My understanding, Councillor, is that it is in that that particular provision of the Act uh, carries across uh, into the current provisions of the Local Government Act. I'm not sure if Mr McMaster or is with us or not, but that is my understanding of, of that particular element and it's recommended that that uh, be adopted. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to refer that to him, Mr. CEO, or because I believe he is in the meeting? He is, yes. Would you? Uh, Mr. McMaster. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, it's correct that that provision of the Act uh, is still in operation. Uh, parts of the 1989 legislation still operate. Um, there have been limited provisions of the 2020 legislation come into operation at this stage, but that will happen um, progressively through to mid-2022. Thank you for that. Thank you Appreciate for the clarification. The Anything else, Councillor Chen? No, nothing further. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers for or against the motion? I have a question, please. Certainly, Councillor Gobley. Um, 3.3, we state that councils have the option to withdraw from the process yeah. at the end of stage two uh -huh. uh, in 2021. Um, if, if that's the case, or even if it's not the case, is there an option for other councils to opt in at any point if it's their inclination? Thank you, Councillor. Oh, it's got an opt-out court laws mm -hmm. for councils. I'm wondering if there's an opt-in. I'll refer that to our CEO, Mr. Andrew Day. I might have to take that on notice, Councillor, if you don't mind, come back to you whether there actually is an opt-in um, point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Are there any other questions on... Uh, are there any other speakers for this particular matter, Councillors? In that case, I will put the motion... Please confirm if you vote for the motion, those four. I see all the hands raised. That motion is therefore carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. That is the last, last item of business for this evening's council meeting, councillors. Thank you for your time and contributions.